We're just going to stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to be going to the book of Numbers, chapter 13, to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. Hallelujah. Thank you all for your faithfulness, for your prayers and for your faith in this room. In Jesus name, Numbers, chapter 13, we'll pick up at verse one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou out men, that they may search out the land of Canaan, which I have given unto the children of Israel. Every tribe of their fathers shall they send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them forth from the wilderness of Paran. I like to speak to you today, church, about stepping into your promised land, stepping into your promised land. How many folks believe God has promised land for you? Amen. He has promised land for you. And we know children of Israel had the promised land right before them. And in the Old Testament, now we have what's called the promises. Over 3,000 plus promises are in the scriptures. And each one of us, one of them are there for us, but they are accessed first by prayer. Let's pray about stepping into our promised land. Father, will you help us today? We ask for your help. We ask for your spirit. But we can't do it without you. Unless you would send mercy and less grace. You said what comes from the throne is justice and judgment, God. We need judgment, God, or we can never receive a reward. You said that you will give a reward to them that diligently seek you. God, we're seeking you, Lord. We're standing before you. Our hearts are laid out before you, God. Lord, will you speak to us? Put something inside of our spirit, God, that we cannot get from man. We can only get it from heaven. And Lord, you have sent the word. You commanded Moses. Moses, it's time for you to send the people out so I can bring them into this land that I want to give them and show them, God. Lord God, take me into my promised land. Let me step into it. Help me to be ready. Oh God, getting ready sometimes is too late. Getting ready is too late. The Lord wants you to have, have got ready. Because when that opportunity comes, getting ready is too late. But we're talking about stepping into our promised land in Jesus' name. Why don't you thank the Lord with me on this evening? Hallelujah. We thank God for his word and all that he has done. And we find in the scripture, in the story of Numbers chapter 13, you, it's a very familiar passage of scripture. It's been given to us many times through the story of Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb and the spies. You know the 12 spies. You know the story of the 12 spies. It's really almost like an elementary Sunday school child, almost like story, because we know the story very well. There were 12 spies that were sent out. God had asked that it to be done. He had commanded it to be done. And in front of the, the leadership, as we're in this series on leadership, everything is going to be touching back on leadership again. There still needed to be some leaders of the 12 spies. We know that God had chose Joshua and Caleb. Now, that's, that's not just because they were good warriors, amen. There are a lot of people that know how to fight, but they're terrible at diplomacy, amen. So you can be a good warrior and still not get where you're supposed to go, amen. As a matter of fact, when I think about my story and my life, my name, Mark, means warrior, and, and, and but... I was in the wrong war. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? I was in the wrong war. And I was thinking about it today when, um, when I was shot when I was 15 years old and I was beaten left for dead. They were they're trying to kill me. That I was 15 years old. There's no way that, that I, I should have been in that position, but it's because I was in the wrong war. Everybody get what, what the Lord was saying. And I keep, the Lord brings me back to this all the time. And as a matter of fact, there were 16 of us 
that was in that group that I was in, and we were marching out into another land. We left our land, and we went to another land, so to spy it out. This is a true story. And then out of those 16 people, about eight of us wind up being shot, but I was the only one that after they shot me, they caught me, dragged me from up under a car, beat me, and put the shotgun in my face to shoot me the second time, but the gun wouldn't fire. I'm telling that story because somebody needs to know that story. You need to understand what God is doing in your life as a result of what he did in my life because I shouldn't even be standing here before you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But it was for the grace of God. It's the only reason that I'm still standing here. Yeah. I hadn't met my wife. We, you know, we, <laughs> I didn't have any children. Or, well, I, I, I had a, 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 a child on the way and he was due to be delivered in three months. So three months before he was going to be born, I was already being killed under a car somewhere. But I was in the wrong war. And that's the whole point. And what the Lord is trying to get folks to see is you got to make sure that you're in the right war. You're, you're a mighty woman of God. You're a mighty man of God. You're, you're uh, as he told Gideon, you're, you're a mighty man of valor. You're someone who can handle battles. You're someone who can get in and out of the battle. You can get strengthened. You'll win some. You might get knocked down a little bit, but you get right back up because you're a warrior. Yeah. You're a warrior. Yeah. The Bible says a righteous man or woman falls seven times but gets back up. What makes us righteous is always the getting back up. It's the getting back up. It ain't the falling, not the knocking down. It's the getting back up that makes us Righteous, because when we get back up, we get back up on the righteousness that Jesus gave us and not our own righteousness. And so you don't have to think you got to get back up and be this super Christian. No, no, you get back up and get back on the road that Jesus had already laid for you. The grooves that he laid out. That's why that word righteousness there is Sadiq. It means grooves. It means tracks. Not your track, someone else that laid some track. So when you get back up, get back in the group. Amen. Amen. And so as we're learning what happened here with the story of Joshua and the children of Israel, we know that God chose Joshua and Caleb. But what is so powerful about that to me and that we never really get the teaching on this is that God was the only one that called him Joshua. God was the only one that called him Joshua because his name was actually Oshia. Joshua's name was Oshia. He was the head of a tribe because when God said, I want you to pick seven, 12 tribes and 12 leaders, and I want you to pick them and to send them out to go out and spy the promised land. If you read it and study, you won't see Joshua's name there as one of the twelve. Though he was one of the twelve, but his name was not called Joshua because the tribe only knew him as O-C-H-E-A. O -C -H -E -A. That was his name. His name wasn't called Joshua. Only God called him Joshua because if you remember, Joshua is also the same Hebrew name for Jesus. Mm, this is very important. But what's even more important or just as important right there is why was his, is his name Oshia never really talked about? You'll see it mentioned a little bit there, but there was a reason. Because remember, when God gets ready to do something with you, he changed Jacob's name to Israel. When he got ready to do something with you, he'll, he'll begin to put a new name on you. He began to put a new spirit on you. He begins to put things on you that you may not have knew you really got inside of you. He begins to reveal what was really going and what he needed in Oshia. He didn't need Oshia just to be a leader of a tribe. He really needed Oshia to be a leader of a nation and to lead that mission. And so his name, Joshua, was only called Joshua by God. None of the people knew him as Joshua. Everybody catching this. This is very, very powerful. Now, what's so powerful about that? Why 
Why was his name Oshia? And why did God pick him to name him even Joshua? Because we only know him as Joshua because God said, send me Joshua. Moses, my servant, is dead. Yeah. And now I need a man whose name is Oshia. The tribe only knows him as Oshia. But God said, send me Joshua. Well, I'm going to tell you why God picked Joshua to lead the whole thing. He picked Joshua and Caleb. But there's a reason why he picked Joshua. Because the name Oshia means salvation through prayer. Hello? Hello? We're not getting anywhere without prayer. Amen. The name Oshia means salvation through prayer. And the name of Joshua means the promise of salvation. So, but Joshua's original name is Oshia. And the tribe never called him that. Only God called him that. He said, send me Joshua, whose name is Oshia, whose name means salvation through prayer. But when God says, and he didn't say, send me Oshia, he said, send me the person that I'm going to use to deliver them. And it means a promise of salvation. It's very, very powerful. So what that teaches us is that prayer and promises are related. You cannot access all the promises of God unless you are prayerful. Amen. That's why even the people in the book of Hebrews, it said many of them died not receiving the promise. Amen. But somebody they prayed for got it. Hallelujah. Uh, amen. amen. Somebody they prayed for got it. Hallelujah. And that's you and I. You and I are going to be left with of many of them we may not get to see or experience, but somebody we're praying for is going to experience it whether we see it in our lifetime or after we're gone because prayer is still going to be moving. Prayer still changes things. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Avail means conquer in the invisible. And that's why that invisible thing is so powerful. That's why prayer is so powerful. Can somebody say thank God for prayer? Thank God for Joshua. And thank God for Oshia. Which was the same person. But it, it, it ought to just blow your mind that God didn't call him Oshia. He called him in, as in what he wanted him to do. To be a promise of salvation. And this is what it is with you and I. There's something that God is calling you into what he wants you to do. So you can step into your promised land. And you'll step into your promised land in the New Testament. Through stepping into the promises and accessing them all through prayer. And somebody say, praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. I want to pick up at, well, let's stay in Numbers for one minute. Let me just show you something else. Go to Numbers 13, 17. Numbers 13, 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land and said unto them, Get you up this way, southward, and go up into a mountain. Whenever you have a Moses in your life, the Moses in your life know which way to tell you to go. Amen. When you have a Moses in your life, I got a Moses in my life. Yeah. I hope you got a Moses in your life. Amen. The, the Moses can't make themselves the Moses of your life. Only you can make the Moses, the Moses of your life. Amen. And so God told Moses through prayer, tell the people to go southward. This is very important because something was going on with the children of Israel. Let's look and see really quick. Let's go to Numbers chapter 12, verse 10. This is what was going on with the children of Israel. Numbers chapter 12, verse 12. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, 
Miriam, Moses' sister, became what? Leprous and white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam and said, Behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly. It was something that was going on with the leadership, and God saw that they were doing foolishly. And when he was talking to Miriam, Miriam started getting the spirit was like, well, you know, God talks to us too, Moses. You're not really the only one God talked to because we anointed too. And she started getting this, this spirit where she started trying to take over and say, well, you know, I'm spiritual too. And, and God, and so the whole thing started interfering with what God wanted to do. He was trying to give them the promised land. He was trying to give them their promises. Uh, but Miriam and Aaron was, was, was slipping back into this selfishness and to this own way of following their own way. And they didn't want to recognize the Moses that God My gave them. God. And God had gave them a Moses. And God has said to them, get thee up and go southward. He didn't say go northward, go westward, then go eastward. Why? Because God was telling Moses which way to tell the people to go. My God. And this is in the spirit. There's some, if the pastor in your Moses is saying, go toward prayer. Run toward prayer. Keep running. They're saying it so that you can access those 3,000 promises. Yes. They're trying to show you yes. how to be able to get a lot of things off of you. Yes. How to lighten your load. Yes. He was telling them. And so this is what was going on. And in verse 10 it said, and the cloud departed off the tabernacle. The cloud, they didn't want to follow the cloud no more. They didn't want to follow the pillar of fire anymore. And so they had decided, well, you know, I'm spiritual. I can start doing it my own way. And that's when they got in trouble. Verse 12. And let her not be as one dead of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord. He prayed, saying, heal her now. Let's pray. Father, heal. Heal them. Heal them right now. Every one of them, God, that have never listened to their Moses. Every one of them, God, that haven't been hearing what their Moses has been saying, God. Heal them right now. God, we don't want to see them destroyed. We don't want to see them consumed. We want to see you heal them, God. Oh, whether we're their Moses or not, we want to see you heal them, God. Because Moses began to cry out and said, heal them, heal them. Heal them. And, and you don't know if you knew what I knew. Uh, there's so many ministers and pastors and, and clergy that's being killed by what I call clergy killers. Uh, they're killing clergy because they keep trying to go their own way. And the, and the clergy is telling them that Moses is saying, go southward. And they wound up in trouble. And the Spirit of God said, well, I was getting ready to lead them into the promised land. I was getting ready to lead them into these 3,000 promises, but they don't want to go southward. <laughs> they want to go whichever way they want to go. <laughs> and so the Lord uh, had to strike Miriam with leprosy. And that was the setup for what was going on. And so then now God had intended for the pillar of cloud to take them to the promised land. He had intended for the pillar of fire to take them to the promised land. Yeah. But because they didn't want to go that way and by the spirit of God and their Moses, God said, OK, then I tell you what, pick out 12 men. It was like when in the children of Israel rejected God and said, God, give us a king. Give us a king. You remember the story. They said, Samuel, we want a king. We want a man. We, we, we want a man to follow. And God kept wanting to be their king all along. And this is what was going on. So God said, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take uh, and tell Joshua. I want you to take the man of prayer. I want you to call prayer as the way to salvation. That was his name, Oshia. His name was Oshia. That's the tribe only knew him by Oshia. The only people that called Joshua, Joshua was God. Hallelujah. If that ain't a revelation, it's, I've been in this thing 25 years and they ain't never taught me that. That's a word. Amen. Hello? Amen. Jesus' name. 
Let's go a little further. <laughs> and so he said to Joshua, Joshua, here's what I want you to do. Let's go back to Numbers 13, verse 17, chapter 17, verse 17. And verse 18, here go Moses talking. And see the land. Pick some people. Go up southward. And I want you to spy out your promises. Spy out the blessings I got for you. And see the land, what it is. Now listen to the three things he told them in verse 18 of chapter 13. He said, I want you to go see the land. What about the land? Go see what it is. Tell somebody, you got to go take a look. You got to go take a look. You got to go see your land. You got to see the promises. You have to go take a look. That's what he was saying. He's like, I need you to get your vision back. I need you to see where I'm trying to take you. I'm trying to, I'm going to get you to see where Moses is pointing you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said three things he wanted them to see. He said, tell all 12 of them with the man of prayer, Joshua, in the front. <laughs> he said, and I want you to go up to this mountain southward and see the land. What about it? What it is. And the people that dwell in it. That's the second thing. He said, not only do I want you to go see the land, but I want you to go see what type of people over here. Hmm. How many folks know that's important? You got, you got to be able to go over there and look and see what type of people are over there. That's very important. Are there people over there that's going to pull me away from God? Or are there people over there that's going to get me to marry out? And then God said, don't go over there and dwell with them because then you're going to want to marry them. And they're going to take you away from God. My How many God. times we've seen that happen? He, he said, go and look, see the land, and see what kind is it. And then when you're there, he said, see what type of people it is there? Always check the type of people. Right. Are they the spirit of God people or not? They might be in a building. They might go to church. They might be people that I call sermon suckers. Can somebody say sermon suckers? Yeah, they just suck sermons. <laughs> they just suck sermons. They suck them down like glasses of water. And, and they, they won't apply it. They won't act on it. They won't exercise it. They won't apply it. They won't act on it. They won't exercise it. They're just sucking down another sermon. Where are you going? I'm going to get another sermon. Sermon suckers. Sermon suckers. Not as bad. It's not, it's not bad in and of itself because the word is powerful. It's alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can do a lot of things. Don't get me wrong. But if you just sucking down another sermon and you haven't acted, exercised, or applied something from the last one, you need to stop eating. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You got to stop eating. <laughs> yeah, but what happens is sometimes when they go their own direction, they, they go and they dwell upon in this place. And, and they saw what, what land it was, but they didn't pay attention to what, what people that dwell in there. Next, he said, whether they be strong or weak, you got to know, you got to be able to evaluate the situation, evaluate the enemy, evaluate the battle that you're in. No one just rushes into a city to try and do battle and you don't have no strategy. You got to have a strategy. Next, he said, also, whether it be few or many, you got to take an inventory of the armies. He said, verse 19, and what the land is that they dwell in. What do you mean? Whether it be good land or bad land. All land ain't good land. Right? right, right. right? Mm -hmm. All land is not good land. In some lands, nothing will grow there. The soil is too toxic. My God. If that's the truth. In farming and topography, they, they, the first thing they do is they test the soil. It could have the pH can be too high. When the pH is too high, it burns whatever is planted in it. And so you keep wondering why it won't grow past the, the pH is too high. And sometimes I found that sermon suckers, they think they can eat on a high level, they can't even digest that word. The word is, is even way over their head. And so that you won't be able to eat right. You need to be able to eat. Where you could chew and you could understand, you could digest your food. My God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go a little further. We're still talking about what stepping into our promised land. Verse 19. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad. 
and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether it's in tents or what? Strongholds. Ah. You got to know, you got to know, you could go over there with your tent mentality and you wind up leaving with a stronghold. Hey, <laughs> my God. You wind up leaving. That's why I run into a lot of times with folks when we meet them and they come from different pastors and teachers and churches, they got strongholds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. They got strongholds. They got these strongholds mean they keep defending this way of belief. They keep defending this way of belief. That's what it means. Stronghold means they keep defending the way of belief. They keep defending why they keep uh, cheating on their marriage. Or they keep defending why they keep using cocaine. They keep defending why they keep lying and won't give their whole life to God. They can keep defending, they keep saying, well, there's a reason why I won't. And there's something that I just keep holding back. And they will tell you what the excuse is. They already know the thing they need to move. <laughs> they, already, they already know what they need to move. And that's called a stronghold. You keep making an excuse while you keep it. All right. Let's go. Look at verse 20. And what the land is, whether it be fat land or lean. Notice what their Moses was telling them. He was like, I need you to understand. I'm, 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 I need you to go and check it out. I need you to go and tell me, is it fat land or lean land? When you get in that land, when you starve, some people, they believe, I'll never forget this one couple tried to get us to move to Oklahoma. And so they went around my pastor, who is my Moses. And they came directly to me. And they said, hey, you ought to come on to Oklahoma and be at one of my pastors. And he thought I was interested in that. I went to my Moses crying. Asked my wife. I went to my Moses in tears, crying. I said, Pastor, they asked me to go over there. And I was like, and I said, I said, was that the right way to do it? He said, no, they should have came to me first. And can I tell you what happened when they went? The man wound up in jail. Wow. That pastor who took my spot wound up in jail in Oklahoma. Destroyed his whole family. Wound up on the sexual uh, list of, uh, on the mega list. The man wound up in there for molestation. I'm trying to tell you, you got to know if the land is lean <laughs> or if it's fat land. Because you could think it's, it's a fat land and you get over there and it get real lean. Hallelujah. Not listening to their Moses. All right, let's go to the next one. Verse, part B of verse 20. Whether there be wood therein or not. How you going to build if you get over there and it ain't no wood? <laughs> and be ye of good courage. Listen, he gave them instructions. He told them when you go over to spy out the land, he's, he told them right there, don't come back with a negative report. He told them, don't come back with a negative report. He said, whether you find it fat or lean, where you find a little or a lot, he said, come back encouraged. Mm -hmm. And what happened to why they wound up in the wilderness? Because 10 of the tribes came back with a negative report. They came back discouraged, but God's instruction was when you come back, whether you like the land or not, whether you saw what you wanted to see or not, he said, come back encouraged. Let's thank God right now for that. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Ghost. He said, whether you like what you've seen over there or not, come back encouraged. Don't mean move. It didn't mean move. It just means hallelujah. We saw that it's lean over there. The Lord told me, don't, don't, don't. The Lord told me, no, no, no. So, and all, and ten of them came back discouraged. My God. Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Oh my God. God knew what he was doing. Watch what he said. And look. And be of good courage when you come back. <laughs> whether the land was good or bad, whether the people were strong or weak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, come back in good courage because I'm still with you. I'm still leading you. You're still listening to your Moses, right? And watch this. And be of good courage. And watch this. And bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first grapes. You know the story. They got over there and they said, we got giant grapes. 
They said, look at these grapes. There's a lot of big grapes up there, remember? God knew when to send them there. He didn't send them there when they weren't going to find grapes. He sent them when he knew they were going to find grapes. Hallelujah. And when he got them there, it was right on time. It was the perfect time for, they, for them to get in the land. But they messed around and got in the land and did the opposite of what God said. He said, whether you like the land or not, come back and curse. That's good. And when they came back, they had a negative report. Only Joshua and Caleb. But I know why Joshua had a positive report. Because he stayed in prayer. Because his name was Oshia. That means prayer delivered. That means prayer promises. That's why God said, send Joshua up to me. Because I know he's going to come back with a good report. Let's thank God for a good report. No matter what Joshua saw, he came back with a good report. Why? Because his name literally means prayer deliverance. Prayer yeah. rescue. And that ain't what Joshua means, but that's what Osea means, yeah. which was his tribal name. Yeah. And the only person that called him Osea was God. Hallelujah. You heard the song before. Oh, say, can you see? I can see Joshua now. That he was like, no matter what I see, I will come back and know what to say. Yeah. Hallelujah. No matter what I see, I'm coming back in courage. Let me give you a couple of things. Now, let's relate all of this to Hebrews chapter 4. My God. And I'm going to let you go right here. Hallelujah. How we doing, Father? Oh, thank you. We got 31 minutes. Let's do it this way. Hebrews chapter 4. Very powerful. Go to verse 1. This is now talking about a caution against falling away. From your 3,000 and something promises. My That's God. what this Hebrews 4 now is. It's talking about don't be like the children of Israel, like the 12 spies. It's like, or you're going to fall away and wander in the wilderness for 400 or 40 years. You're going to wander. And he was in this Hebrews 4, he was cautioning against falling away from your promises. And the number one way to fall away from your promises is by falling away from prayer. Because you cannot access all of them except by prayer. Hallelujah. That's why he says pray for all men, especially those in authority. He said pray all the time. He says pray for all saints and prayer and supplication. Let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall be in your hearts and your mind. You want to get away from anxiety? You want to get away from stress? He gave you the perfect pill. It's called prayer. Remember, the Latin word for prayer means to take the bite out of something. It's some stuff that's still biting you because you ain't put enough prayer on it. Hello? I promise you. And that's why it's called pro-core or pre-core for Latin. That's the word for prayer. You ain't putting enough prayer on it. That's why it's still biting you. See, in extermination work, when we use the chemical called pre-core, it stops the thing from growing teeth. And it stops it from having an organ to be able to produce babies. That's what's called pre-core and pest control. It's powerful. So why is it in Latin that the name of prayer is called pre -core? It's because if you put enough prayer on it, it'll stop having babies. If you put enough prayer on it, it'll stop duplicating. If you put enough prayer on that thing, I promise you, I believe in prayer like nobody's business. I'm hooked on it. I'm, you, you know me. I done already changed my ministry. It's forget preaching. I'm only going to do this as long as he let me. But as soon as I can, I'm going to pray more than I preach. I promise yeah. you that. Yeah. Because I can pray higher than I can preach. Yeah. I can pray higher than I can yeah. think. Yeah. And besides, well, I've been doing this now for nine years with no pay. Would you do that? Jesus. We've been pastoring nine years with no pay. Would you do that? <laughs> Would you deal with people, their problems, their issues, their sin, their love, their likes, their dislikes? They're talking about you. They're not following their Moses. Would you do that for nine years with no pay? <laughs> I was thinking about it the other day. Because, you know, my wife and I, we're licensed. We're ordained. We could take a church right now in Oregon. They'll give me $6,000 a month. They'll pay for my house and my 
car payment. Can we go? Mm. No? <laughs> Can we go home? No? I'm just trying to look at my wife. <laughs> my wife was, it sounds tempting to me, but 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 are you hearing what I'm saying though? Is, is, is you gotta, without prayer, we wouldn't even still be here. Amen. But because we we hung on and hung in there, we stayed in there, and, and, and no matter what, we, we lighten the blows, we take the teeth out of stuff, we, we stop it from infesting the, the house and infesting the church by prayer, just keeping hot prayer on the situation because we know it's going to break that thing down and it's going to destroy the nest. Amen. Let's go. Hebrews chapter 4. Can somebody say, let us. Let us. Therefore, fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into rest and of you should seem to come short of it. Verse one tells us straight right there. Accessing these 3000 promises through the covenant of God. It's, it's, he's saying, look, don't let it slip. You got access to it right now. All of us, every one of us, the children of Israel, They showed us how you lose your access to these promises. But watch what he was telling them. He was saying the rest that he's talking about is a rest of communion. He said, don't let it slip. What? My communing with God. Don't let your prayer slip. Don't let your rest slip. Everybody catching that? This is what he's talking about. When he's saying right here, don't fall short of the promises through falling short of a lack of communion. If you don't commune with the Lord, you're going to fall short in accessing all the promises. He wants you to access it. That's why he was sent. He, he's cautioning you from falling away from all these promises you ain't even got to yet. Yeah. That's what the caution is here. Look at verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as to them. He's talking about the gospel in the wilderness. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about the gospel in the wilderness. Everybody hear that? He's talking about the gospel in the wilderness. He's talking about the gospel that they heard in ancient Israel. He's talking about the 12 tribes. He's talking about all of them. They heard something, but they wound up in the wilderness anyway. Why? Because they didn't mix what they heard with faith, the Bible says. Amen? Amen. Now, here's something very powerful. Help me understand belief from faith. This is important. Because he said it didn't profit them because they not, what they heard, they didn't mix it with faith. He didn't say they didn't mix it with belief. The difference is belief will allow you to believe in a truth. You can believe in the truth. A lot of people will go to church because they believe. But how come they're not entering into their promise? How come they're not entering into their promised land? How come they're not going any further? They believe. Why? Because faith is different from belief. Faith will allow you to access places past what you believe. My <laughs> It allows you to access stuff past what you believe. Because it allows you to go to it. Some people believe, but they won't go to it. But you can't have faith without going to it. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Tell somebody, I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to my 3,000 promises. I promise you, I'm, I'm going to act on it. I'm going to apply it. And I'm going to exercise it. That's the difference between belief and faith. And that's why you don't have to have the perfect education. You ain't got to have the perfect looks. I look so good to God, it ain't even fun. And I know I'm 40 pounds of the weight. But guess what? That between me and God, there ain't nobody else business. Because God tells us in the Bible, stop measuring man. And it said, you knew Jesus once this way. It said, but now he done died on the cross. And now he has a ministry of intercession. It said, don't look at him how you saw him before he died on the cross. It says, don't compare him anymore. So it tells us, don't compare yourselves anymore. Don't compare yourselves against anybody else. Yeah. I like these little extra yeah. 30 or 40 pounds yeah. I've got. Come you on. ought to see me when it's time to fight. Amen. Uh, Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> I know how to handle myself. I, I will kick, I will bite, I will 
I will eat your flesh and drink your blood. That's just how I fight. That's just how I fight. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you the truth. Uh, my, they named me warrior for some reason. <laughs> and a warrior going to use everything he got. The warrior. <laughs> Did you know when they used to baptize warriors in the old days that they would not baptize their sword? Ah. Did y'all know that? When they baptized warriors in the old days, that the warrior wouldn't let them baptize them without a sword. And when they baptized them, they took everything down in the water except the sword. Because the warrior, the warrior said to the pastor and he said to the priest, I'm so sorry. I might be new, but this thing got a job to do. And it's going to cut some blood. Tell somebody you better get your sword back. You better get your sword. Oh, I'm telling this is the truth. Amen. And so they got pictures of these folks being death baptized, and the only thing hanging out the water is that sword and that fist. Because they're like, you know what, Pastor, I ain't even gonna lie to you. Pastor, I ain't even gonna lie to you. <laughs> when it's time to chop, chop, you're gonna have to pray for them because I'm not. You, you gonna have to pray for them because I ain't in the mood for praying. <laughs> Oh, so this is a true story. Let's go a little further. Hallelujah. This is we talking about. You got to lay hold of it. He was like, don't slip. Don't miss the promises. Verse two. For unto us was the gospel preached as it was unto them. But the word not being mixed with faith, it didn't profit them not being mixed with faith. And them that heard it, I can't mix it for you. It has to be mixed by you. Can't apply it for you. It got to be mixed by you. For we which have believed, now believe, do enter into the rest. And as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundations of the world, for he have spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. Remember he was saying God rested on the seventh day? Uh Can I tell you something? About the day we go to church on. We know Saturday is the seventh day. But the Bible tells us when it was changed to church day as Sunday. It's in the scripture. That was why it's called the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day isn't called the seventh day or Saturday. The Lord's Day was the day that you came and came to church. That's why That's why uh, Thomas missed the blessing from God. Because he wasn't there. And Thomas said, I won't believe until I touch his hands. I won't believe until I see this. It's because he did miss something because he missed that day. All right. Now watch this. What's supposed to happen on the Lord day? Well, on the Lord day, never supposed to talk about your problems. That was a rule. Did you know that? Wow. Did you know that? In ancient Israel, when they had the seventh day Sabbath, it was against their law for you to talk about your diabetes, for you to talk about your cancer, for you to talk about your divorce, for you to talk about any problem you had for the whole day. Amen. That's powerful. That's powerful. That was a spoken rule back then. That's why when they was, Jesus came and he said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I didn't came to destroy the Sabbath. I came to fulfill the Sabbath. And because they were like, well, Jesus, why are you healing on the Sabbath? Why are you getting the animals out there? Thing on the Sabbath. And, but the rule was you couldn't talk about any problem you had on the Sabbath. All you could talk about was, hallelujah, ain't God good? Uh-huh. Come on. Hallelujah, ain't the Lord powerful? Hallelujah, ain't the Lord good? I believe the Lord can fix it, brother. I believe the Lord can fix it, sister. And I believe the Lord can fix it, brother. I believe the Lord can fix it. That was the only thing that was supposed to be talked about. Amen. Okay. On the Lord's day. That's why he said God entered into rest. And when you and I come into the gospel and come into faith, you and I are supposed to be resting too. Amen. Amen. 
Yes. From the works of complaints. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We supposed to, whether we like how the land look or not, if we can't be positive one whole day oh out of the seven, this is what the Lord was saying. At least on the seventh day, on the Lord day, he's like, I need you to be encouraged. Amen. Tell somebody, I got it. Oh, I got it. And I'm entering into my rest. I'm entering into my rest. And one of the signs that you entered into your rest was death. Because it said the Lord stopped working on the seventh day. It didn't mean he stopped working completely. It means he was satisfied with what he saw. Are you satisfied with what he's doing? That's how you know that you are in the rest. Oh my goodness. Come on. Let's go to the throne of grace right now. We're going to pray. Father, take us into the throne of grace. Lord, you said go boldly, go boldly, go boldly, go boldly into the throne of grace. Why is it called the throne of grace? It's called the throne of grace because not only is it undeserved favor, but it literally means undeserved favor and loving reward. That's why he says go boldly. Because there's a loving reward that comes with undeserved favor. So that's why you and I should break our necks to prayer. You and I should break our necks to run in there. Because not only do I don't deserve being here, but whether you like it or think you deserve it or not, he's handing you some loving favor. Let's pray. Father, help us today. Help us today. Help us today to enter into this rest, God. Lord, we want to be like Oshia. Or his name was Joshua. Because we believe, huh, God, that was the only way we could access these promises. The only way we could access what you're doing in my life. Huh? I can't do it. I ain't got enough money to do it. Even if I had enough money, I can't figure it all out. Huh? God, there's a lot of things going on in my heart. A lot of things going on in my spirit. Huh? God, I want to take my sword and chop some people up. Huh? Oh, but will you help me right now, God? Huh? Help me, Lord, huh? to learn, God, huh? how to rest, huh? You said that you rested, and now it said everyone that hears the gospel and mix it with faith, you do enter into this rest. He said, now therefore I remain a rest for the people of God. The scripture says this. If you ain't resting, you ain't a people of God. My God. That's what the scripture is telling us. You cannot be a people of God and not be in rest. Hallelujah. Help me, God. I got to enter into this thing. Oh, we pray for everyone in here today. We pray for the those that's going to hear this message in Ethiopia and Uganda and Sudan. Oh, Lord, those that's going to hear it in Kenya and those that's going to hear it in, in, uh, in Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guatemala, Lord. Lord, there are places that, Lord, these people are playing these messages. We don't even know they're playing them. But I pray that the Holy Spirit will get them and that they will get satisfied with you and they will hear the report and they will come back like Joshua and Caleb. Oh, somebody that believed in prayer and say, you know what, whether we like the land or not, we're going to be encouraged because then it must mean God don't want me to go into it. Lord, will you bless everyone that hears this word today and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's pray, church. Let's pray. Let's give them some praise. Hallelujah.